Good evening, everybody. Welcome to a very special summer summer edition of School Psyched Podcast. As you can see, we look a little bit different tonight. Um, fun, fun present from Google was discontinuing YouTube Live and Hangouts on Air, which is the platform that we were using and we were comfortable with streaming uh, live from a free platform. And so that just went away in August. So that was really fun to discover. And so we kind of have this scramble of what are we going to do? And um, Andrew, our, our little producer that we, we've dubbed him producer, I don't know if he likes the title or not, but he uh, mentioned this other platform. So we're kind of trying it today and we've got it set up that we're streaming to Facebook. So um, not our normal, and Rebecca's going to talk a little bit about how you're participating tonight, but I want you to keep in mind, let us know what you think about this new format, um, because we do have the option we can stream through the same platform uh, from to Facebook, or we can stream to YouTube. So if we feel like YouTube is a better format for comments and things, we can always go back to that. So we might put a poll out or something, um, but let us know. Uh, that being said, we're probably going to have some technical difficulties tonight as we stumble through how to use this new program and um, just get acquainted with it. So please just bear with us um, and, and hang in there. Um, but tonight, too, I wanted to say that this topic, we, we decided to have this summer episode because this is kind of... Um, uh, an in progress kind of developing story in the world of school psychology. And it was a story that I was following before I even know, knew that a school psychologist was involved in it. So I was super impressed when um, an article got passed to me that, that mentioned a school psychologist I was like, oh my gosh, and kind of dug a little bit further and saw some of the awesome things. And so, so excited um, for her to be here tonight to talk about advocacy and just this whole situation and what's going on in North Carolina right now. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop my talking and my yammer and I'm gonna pass it over to Rebecca Rebecca, who is going to tell you how to participate tonight. Rebecca? Hi, everyone. Well, your guess is as good as mine, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> I will be looking for comments right under the live feed on Facebook on the School Psych Podcast page. So please feel free to comment with questions, thoughts, anything, um, uh, observations about our new platform. We are we see that there are several of you out there now, so that's kind of cool. Um, hello, everybody. And also on Twitter, if you're listening to the Facebook Live and you can open your Twitter account, please tweet using the hashtag Psyched Podcast. I will be looking for notifications and hoping to hear from you. This is a really um, exciting guest that we have. I'm so uh, looking forward to hearing speaking with her and I will introduce Eric who will introduce our guest. Hi Eric. Hello. Um, we are excited to have Dr. Chelsea Bartell with us this evening and as was already mentioned we heard about her story and we're excited to talk with her about what's going on especially once we found out she was a school psychologist. So um, as uh, Rachel already said as well, we're trying to figure out this new technology and new format. So um, it's kind of interesting. I call this the Brady Bunch format where we're all sort of stacked um, above one another. So um, Dr. Bartel, I'll introduce our, our guest this evening. Dr. Bartel is a school psychologist practicing full time in three K through eight schools in large districts in North Carolina. She also maintains a small private clinical practice where she provides psychotherapy services to primarily adults. Dr. Bartell earned her master's degree in clinical psychology from Washburn University in Topeka, Kansas, and her doctorate in school psychology at North Carolina State University. She completed year-long internships in clinical psychology at a behavioral health clinic in Kansas City and in school psychology at a large urban school district in North Carolina. She also completed a postdoctoral fellowship designing and researching the effectiveness of computer games to assess and teach social skills. Her research and practice interests include consultation, psychoeducational evaluation, and increasing the use of evidence-based practices in school. Dr. Bartell is a member of the North Carolina Psychological Association's Continuing Education Committee, and she serves on the leadership team for North Carolina families for school testing reform a parent advocacy, advocacy group working for fewer tests, fairer tests, and fruitful tests for students. She has two children heading into fourth and second grades this year. And she has had an interesting go this spring uh, in trying to figure out some best practices for reading instruction and dealing with uh, 
corporate bureaucracy, I guess we could say. And, uh, yeah. Dr. Bartel, how, let's just introduce you and, and have you tell us a little about what's going on. Yeah, so it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm just a pretty regular school psychologist, uh, but I am interested in current events and the legislature, and I try to keep up as best as I can with educational news. Um, this one was pretty unavoidable. So what happened is on the last day of the traditional calendar school year, which I believe was, I think it was June 7th, uh, 2019, our state superintendent, Mark Johnson, announced that he had signed a contract with this company called iStation and that we were going to use um, as a universal screener for all K-3 students in North Carolina who would be using iStation's um, indicators of readiness, basically. It's their universal screener called iSIP. And that is big news in North Carolina because for the past five years at least, um, and even longer in a lot of schools, we've been using Dibbles and uh, specifically we've been using Amplify's in-class assessment as our universal screener. So we're really familiar with uh, Dibbles, we're familiar with TRC, and that's how we understand data and use it to plan our interventions. So it was just kind of a huge deal when on the very last day of school, um, he made this announcement and sort of immediately raised some red flags um, because just last year we had purchased, I'm not sure the total number, but a lot, we'd spent a lot of taxpayer money to update our in-class materials. We had to get all new books and um, different materials like that. And we had done that statewide just one year ago. Um, and so now they announced that we're signing a completely different contract with a completely different company. Um, and that was sort of enough, I think, combined with it being summer break and me having free time and other advocates across the state having free time that um, just those red flags. And um, to be fair, I, I'm not a huge fan of our state superintendent and some of the um, decisions that he's made and his experience, I don't think qualifies him for that office. But um, so I kind of go into it already skeptical. Um, and then, you know, to have some additional red flags raised that sort of um, tip the scales for a lot of people. And we all just kind of started writing about it and connecting with each other. And um, it took off from there. Yeah. Wow. When, when uh, the Twitterverse exploded with uh, what you were researching and sharing, um, everybody was like, wow, this school psychologist is so brave and so awesome and thorough. Do you, was that um, something, being skeptical and looking at research in that way, was that part of your training program or was that part of your, um, part of your being as a school psychologist from the start? Um, yeah, I would say so. I think my training program, um, both of them, my clinical program and even more so the school psych program, just kind of taught all of us to be really critical, um, to learn how to evaluate journal articles and learn how to really question the claims of publishers, you know, who are hopefully in it to help children, but also need to make a profit. And that's just the nature of the world. So we have to go into it with our expertise and really bring our expertise, whether that's statistics or um, just general testing procedures and what's developmentally appropriate. And you know, we have so much knowledge in this area specifically related to assessment that when the state is looking at spending $8 million <laughs> for an assessment, um, I think school psychs are critical to have at the table. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, people have said that I'm brave and that's probably because I got a cease and desist um, from an attorney. <laughs> so that what happened was we all started writing um, people who have blogs. I don't really have a blog about school psych. So I just sort of wrote Google documents um, about really, I just wanted to make notes for myself at first about the research um, and digging into iStation's research. And then um, as more and more came out, we kind of all started connecting. And um, it, about mid-July, I got um, by email and by actual mail um, a cease and desist and preservation notice from an attorney which was basically just saying that by sharing my documents publicly and um, questioning research claims, 
I was uh, defaming iStation. And so I had to um, preserve all of my text messages and emails and all communication since January 1st. Um, and then I also just had to be on alert that I was not to talk about iStation um, or do anything. Um, it even said that I couldn't discuss it in public or in private. So, um, so I just replied by, well, I talked to some attorneys and then I <laughs> replied to the attorney who sent me the cease and desist and just asked for clarification um, and said that I was happy to discuss any anything that was of concern, but there were no examples um, or specific statements that I had made that were defamatory provided. So, and I still haven't um, been told that any specific thing I've said or done is defaming uh, the company. So my reason for being here and reason for still talking about it is really just because I believe strongly in science and the scientific method that we all learn and we have to question research claims. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong and that's fine. It's just, we have to be able to have these kinds of discussions. Absolutely. Wow. You're that's, I, I feel like school psychologists, we do, we have this, this knowledge on, on so many topics yet at the, the district level and the state level, you know, we're not, I guess maybe people just don't think of school psychologists as having knowledge in some of these areas. And so we're, we're not involved in some of these decisions when really I think that it's important that maybe we start to think about how can we get a seat at the table and how can we become involved and share some of that knowledge? Um, you know, how, just like you did, I mean, just going through a Google doc and I saw, and I think that everybody should check out your Google docs and they're linked there in, in the, um, in the video uh, description here. Um, and just, you know, going through all the research and, and bit by bit kind of critiquing and looking at it. And, you know, it was just awesome to read. I was like, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a little irreverent, I guess. Um, there was some discussion on that in an advocacy group I'm in that was sharing some of my research because I'm not, um, you know, it's clear whose side I'm on, I guess, if there's a side. I don't, I don't work for Amplify at all, but you know, that I'm I'm pretty critical of iStation and of our superintendent and not um, afraid to say so because we live in America and freedom of speech is important in a democracy. Yeah, especially when it comes to children. I mean, it's clearly just, yeah. you know, it just comes off as such a stare, scare tactic that you're gonna say yeah. it's in this right. letter and you need to stop talking about this because I don't want you to talk about this. You know, right. it's- <laughs> Yeah, yeah. and th there's such a glut of for-profit educational companies and testing companies. And if they're going to get taxpayer dollars, they need to demonstrate that they're appropriate, accurate, efficient, mm -hmm. uh, valid, you know, reliable, and have research to back it up. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. And people don't understand that there's a difference, you know, when we say research, that's kind of a broad term, but there's, you know, different kind of levels of, you know, peer reviewed or not peer reviewed. Mm -hmm. and who has a conflict of interest and who's funding the study. Right. So a, a research, you know, claim that was conducted by an employee of a testing company, maybe you should be a little bit more wary of that than like an independent right. type of um, situation. But I think that too, um, what concerns me is, I mean, I don't really know what goes on behind the scenes, but it seems like a lot of these companies try and kind of wine and dine districts. That when you're talking about an $8 million contract, you know, they're, they're sending, uh, you even go to NASP and you might get, you know, a cookie that says, I remember when you're going, when the whisk was coming out and I got like a whisk cookie and there's like, you know, come down and have a drink of wine and have this. And so these companies, they, they put out kind of propaganda and little keychains and little pens and everybody knows I love my pens. Um, <laughs> but there, we just have to be careful of that. And I feel like when districts kind of get sucked into, and I don't know what type of kickbacks districts as a whole might get from these big companies when companies are bidding for such a large contract. But I imagine, you know, there's yeah. <laughs> yeah. And our superintendent um, a year ago, I didn't really look into this, but it was kind of big news in the state that he spent, um, I believe it was $6 million on iPads. So, and he like, it came out that he had been flown to California and toured Apple, you know, and done all, and then suddenly we're spending six million dollars on iPads that are um, a lot of them still in a warehouse, which wow. they just they acknowledged in the July 2019 State Board of Education meeting. 
they said, yeah, we'll have to get some out of the warehouse. Um, so they still have them just sitting there for over a year. So yeah, there are, I think there are some things going on and I, people have really tried to dig into it with this ice station contract. And there are, you know, you can easily look up um, political donations um, as long as they're not to a PAC. I think you can find out you know, exactly who people donated to. So I know who the CEO of iStation is giving money to, and I know who the CEO of Amplify is giving money to. Um, I think that's really important as much as you can to look at publicly available documents and just kind of vet things a little bit on your own and see how the money flows in your own district and in your own state. Um, because so much of it is going to come down to money and you just have to be knowledgeable in what you're talking about um, when you go to your representatives and, and start advocating. Mm -hmm. sure. yeah, um, I wanted to ask you, I'm always, I always kind of have this inner very early career newbie person <laughs> on the inside. And I wonder um, what advice would you give for a new person to get to know those kind of, that kind of information and, and be able to advocate in, in such a powerful way for, for their kids? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the first thing to do is get involved in your state organization. Um, so the state school psych or um, state psychological association or both, um, and then NAS or APA or both, just to, uh, being involved on that level is gonna be the first point of contact, I feel like for a lot of people, uh, because you'll get the weekly or monthly updates and usually they'll have some kind of advocacy or legislative update. And so you'll just start reading. Um, and that's really how I started was, you know, being part of organizations, going to conferences and just sort of hearing, oh, the legislature passed this new um, read to achieve act and now we're going to retain third graders who aren't proficient at the end of the year you know that's you just hear these things and then you can start questioning um, and looking you know just I think most school psychologists are probably pretty good at googling and it's fun to google things and people and research them so um, that's sort of the next step that I took was just looking into statements or things that I heard about upcoming laws um, and being involved in your PTA is a good thing. If your kids are in school, to be involved in their PTA, or um, even if you don't have children, getting involved in the PTA at one or more of the schools that you work in, um, I think that's just amazing. And I don't think it happens too often that school staff even come to those meetings. Mm -hmm. So that's a great place to start. And PTA is really all about advocacy. That's kind of what they were founded to do. Mm -hmm. If they're doing it right, they're advocating. Awesome. You mentioned like a state association and NASP have, and so you're getting information from that and, that and that's helping. Have, has there been an organized effort from either your state association or NASP or is it kind of you taking information and then blazing a trail or how, how, how are they supporting you or how, how is that looking? Um, I don't know if they're supporting me. I haven't heard from my state psych organization or NASP. Um, they're not, not supporting me you know they're not telling me to stop um i've definitely gotten support from individual school psychologists in my state and elsewhere um like all of you so that's been good i think my state organization actually does a great job um and is getting better every day with advocacy and we have a lobbyist and um we're really working it's hard in north carolina we're very red um and our legislature is just kind of recovering from having a period of a super majority that was very anti-education. And now we just have a majority that's anti-education. So we're, um, we're trying, we don't have a budget yet. Anyway, that's off the topic, but yeah. Um, I feel like that's, I don't know if I was answering the question, <laughs> was I? Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, I feel like they haven't, you know, they're very, they haven't specifically supported me, but they do support school psychologists. Um, the North Carolina School Psych Association is great with advocacy and fight, they fought really hard to improve our ratios and to increase our pay. Actually, they wanted to get us a thousand dollars a month increase just across the board. Every school site gets a thousand more dollars every month, um, which had us all dreaming of the luxurious lives that we would lead. And <laughs> <laughs> it didn't go anywhere in the legislature because that's, a lot of money so but when we have you know eight million dollars for this assessment tool we have the money 
So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I, I, I've just talked about because I was in North Carolina for five years. So mm -hmm. I've talked about that on the podcast here, and I ended up leaving um, just because in the five years that I was there, I didn't get the pay increase at all. I mean, it was just frozen, and I felt like it wasn't. Um, I wasn't supported in my district and, um, and you know needed a little bit extra help so i especially kind of feel for you and appreciate the battle that you're fighting um i know that you know it's i live i live the cushy life here right now in maryland <laughs> yeah yeah i've had friends who left north carolina and went up north and keep trying to convince me to move up there but i'm good here i'm just gonna keep fighting yeah we need you there <laughs> and we did get a viewer comment. Jen says, thank you for fighting the good fight for our students. Oh, Share thank that. you. Um, and unions, I know that North Carolina, they don't have unions, um, but yeah, that might be a good, would that be, I don't know if this is be something that a union would get involved in or not. I'm trying to think about my union. I feel like they probably wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Have yeah, seat. I mean, we have the, like, I'm a member of the National Education Association um, and the Durham Association of Educators. That's where I live. So that's our division. But technically, right, they call themselves a union, but in North Carolina, we don't have unions. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I think, I don't know that a union would really get involved until there was an actual lawsuit brought, you know. If they wanted me to show up in court, I feel like somebody would get involved. <laughs> if if I were in a state that had a union, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, um, just in in looking at the research that you looked at, what might be some things that a school psychologist could look for in terms of outcomes for mm -hmm. reading programs or curriculum. Um, you know, for example, I think my concerns in reading everything, uh, well, certainly there were, I had concerns in what I read about the, um, research that was done and by whom, uh, it was done by, but then also some concerns about base rates and how those were being represented. So, but that's sort of, uh, something I love to look into and perhaps mm -hmm. the average school psych might not have an interest in that, um, any thoughts about how people might be able to just dig a little deeper, even if they're not into base rates and. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, I always like tell the students I test that I would probably be diagnosed with a math disability. Like I just, it does not click for me. So statistics was my worst subject in school and in grad school. Um, and I think I just kind of scraped by, so I am not a statistician or a psychometrician extraordinaire. But really, I just started um, with kind of this curious questioning approach that I try to take um, in meetings and just trying to uncover what's going on. So um, I think the the path I took is a really accessible path. I, I literally started by tweeting at iStation and saying, hey, show me some independent peer reviewed research on your product and your reliability and your validity because that's what I want to know when we're looking at this new assessment tool. And they replied pretty quickly. Um, this was back when they were talking to me. And they gave me seven links to um, articles. You know, they said, sure thing here, you know, check out this research. And that's really how I started. And um, really the, the red flags just sort of came immediately because out of the list of seven um, articles they provided, only two of them were actually published peer reviewed articles. Um, and the tip off for that, if you're um, an early career psych or new, you know, in grad school, um, if it's behind a paywall, <laughs> it's the kind of article that you want. So I couldn't access those because I don't have any university access anymore. Um, so I emailed the lead authors, which is the way to go, and you will get free articles all the time. So um, they both replied within a couple of hours and provided me a PDF and said, happy to talk, you know, if you have any questions, um, which was amazing. And then a friend of mine, I'd been posting on Facebook about what, you know, trying to find articles or trying to find this or that. And a friend of mine found one of the lead author's dissertation, which the published article was based off of. Um, so then I was able to read her full dissertation as well, which was great. 
um, and then email her back and forth and chat with her on the phone um, and just get like a really thorough understanding of her study and what she concluded and what she didn't conclude because um, iStation relies really heavily on her research um, to prove the efficacy of their product. Um, and I think they're stretching a bit there. So <laughs> that is sort of the first way I started. And then as far as the other five links they sent me, they were pretty much all um, like white papers. You know, they were written in-house by the company selling the thing that they want you to buy. And all of those articles said, the thing is great, buy it. Um, so, you know, I think any any school site can do that. Just, just a little bit of digging. And then if you kind of find a red flag, then keep digging and keep digging. And that's really what my summer has consisted of. I love to poll and ask school sites out there how many times a similar situation has been presented to them, whether it's a an assessment tool or an intervention or some kind of product that they're not really sure about. And mm -hmm. um, and I and I I think what makes it seem so overwhelming and and difficult also from my lens is like you were saying that sometimes it's the research itself is is okay but then the way that they are making conclusions based on it or the way that they um create a product based on you know something that is you know maybe a conclusion or something from the evidence that's very narrow and they make these broad claims or whatever so it's so intricate it seems really tricky but mm -hmm. i love that you're sharing these tips because this is like our our, our essentials right here our essentials mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it helped my postdoc. I worked at this company that made video games to teach social skills, um, teach and assess social and emotional skills, um, which is a really cutting edge idea um, mm -hmm. and one that we it's great to investigate, um, I would say. But we can't really make big definitive claims about whether that works. You know, can you teach um, impulse control through a video game? Maybe. But um, that company was funded on grants, so we had to win grants. And so I learned how to do that and how to promote a product in a way that was not um, untruthful, but, you know, just so sort of in its very best possible light. Um, and I think that iStation, it, just the similarities between that and the place where I did my postdoc really kind of tipped me off too that something was going on that um, or that at the very least maybe they're overstating their research claims and maybe we should question you know and, and look a little bit more into their um, norming sample or you know just kind of double check some things um, before we say okay I'm going to look at a student's ICIP scores and I'm going to know everything there is to know about them and put them on this trajectory um, and I, I don't think so, you know, as a school site getting ready to start school this year, I'm really not going to take um, ICIP scores, not going to really spend any time evaluating them. Um, I'll probably just give my own CBMs, mm -hmm. you know, whereas when we were giving, <laughs> yes, <laughs> whereas when we were doing Dibbles, um, you know, as long as they were being progress monitored and, and things were kind of with real world fidelity, mm -hmm. um, fidelity enough, I would take those data and um, rely on them and make some conclusions, you know, kind of feed them into the report and all the things that we were looking at for eligibility. That's good. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I think, you know, we, we have this term that um, sort of gets facetiously thrown around cash validity, right? So the, <laughs> you know, the, the value of some of these products are really in when money and power are involved, you know, are inflated um, significantly. So I think being skeptical is so important. And in this day and age too, where, and not to knock our tests and our publishers, um, but we have a flood of new tests and we purchase them sort of research on scene sometimes. Our districts purchase them, we trust the sales reps, we trust the companies, um, and we assume that the assessment is going to be 100% accurate and account for 100% of the variance in a child's scores, when in fact, maybe we get 50% of the variance accounted for, or um, or it's all G-saturated or whatever. Uh, so 
you know, it, it's just refreshing to see that somebody's standing up. I mean, it, it's sort of, you know, grassroots uh, reminds me of the, you know, these movements that, um, you know, historically have made a lot of change. And it took somebody to stand up to uh, the power and and say, hey, I have a question, you know, where taxpayer dollars are involved and mm -hmm. children's outcomes are involved. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think it's been helpful that I'm not alone. Um, you know, I don't have like school psych organizations publicly supporting me, uh, mm -hmm. but I do have plenty of school psychs behind me and even um, other educators. So it was, there were three people who got cease and desist letters and uh, from iStation's attorney and the three of us are all different. Um, I'm a school psych. One of them is a teacher in Charlotte who's just an amazing advocate um, all the time about every possible issue. And then uh, one is um, someone who formerly worked at the Department of Public Instruction, was involved in the procure procurement, um, who is now running for superintendent um, against Mark Johnson. Well, she's one of the Democratic primary candidates. but. Yeah, um, the three of us have even talked and been in touch and been very supportive of each other. Um, and then the testing reform group that I'm a part of um, has been phenomenal and has organized, they organized a press conference, um, they gathered signatures. So we had like all the state PTA and teacher organizations and I think it was over 350 individual signers um, asking for a delay in iStation implementation and asking for um, Mark Johnson to respond and speak with us, which he did not. Um, but yeah, I think it, there's no way that it, I could be involved as much as I have been without being a part of all these different groups that are doing their own advocacy things. Um, so that's been really neat to be a part of too and to get to meet other people through doing advocacy because you'll run into people who do it and have been doing it for years. Very cool. I, so you kind of approached this, I mean, it was summertime, so you kind of did this, you know, like we said, grassroots kind of outside, and, you know, um, would you have changed your tactic if it was mid-year? Would you have like gone within the or within your school and those channels? Or do you think that this was more effective to kind of hit it from outside? Oh, um, yeah, I think from outside. And I think if it happened mid year, I don't know that I would be here. I mean, I just, there, I wouldn't have had time. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, yeah, I guess it's interesting. I don't know. I don't know what would have happened if it had come out mid year. Although we were told, um, I did finally get to meet with our superintendent on Friday and we were told that the plan all along was to announce the winner of the contract in February to give everyone more time to get ready to assess students um, in July is when our year round school starts. So yeah, I think probably though, I think that's one of the things I like about being a school psychologist is that um, we are kind of separate from the schools that we serve. Um, sometimes, I guess the, the model of districts that I've worked in um, in North Carolina is pretty much each psych has two or three or four um, or for a while last year, I had five schools. And so you're at these schools um, and you are a part of them to some degree, but it's you're still kind of this outside voice that can say, actually, the law is this or we need to do it this way. Um, so I, that's a role that I think we're good at um, and and being able to communicate in a kind way, but still kind of a forceful way to say, this is how things need to be done. Um, I don't know, I don't know if that makes sense, but I feel pretty comfortable in that role, like coming in as an outsider, questioning what decisions have been made so far, I guess. I think that may be what it takes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, somebody to from the outside to come in and say, hey, what's going on here? Um, you know, I, I think about a number of things, just the damage that we did to kids back in the 90s with um, whole language and not teaching uh, phonemic skills, phonemic awareness and phonic skills and things that research has clearly shown us um, are necessary for reading instruction. And, you know, and I, and I think about sometimes when we change curricula, we change uh, testing processes, there's a window 
where kids sort of get lost in the balance, right? If it's effective and if the previous one was not effective, we've got to switch everything over and we still end up losing time with kids, losing instruction with kids. And we rely on these programs to sort of save us, right? So I, I really think questioning them is in our best interest, in the kids' best interests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, and it's really important too, to make sure that the people doing the research and making the decisions are the, the right people, you know, the mm -hmm. people with the right skill sets. Um, so one thing that happened in North Carolina with this whole contract procurement process is that um, they had to do a request for proposals and that initial RFP was canceled um, because there was a whistleblower and someone on the committee who signed a, you know, a statement saying that they didn't have any conflicts of interest. Um, well, it turned out that they had been previously employed by Amplify. So that whole committee was disbanded. It was over. Um, they had to start again with the whole RFP for the universal screener. screener. Um, so that committee, the second committee, was formed in 2018 in the fall. Um, and that committee was robust. They had 22 members. 11 of them were voting members. And um, there were at least two, if not three, school psychologists employed by the Department of Public Instruction. Um, there were reading specialists, early literacy, early childhood specialists, psychometricians, um, digital learning people. You know, I mean, it's 22 people going over all these RFPs and um, or all the all the proposals that were sent in, um, and rating these different uh, assessment companies. And uh, their the recommendation that they made to our superintendent happened in December 2018. And then in January 2018, um, he convened a meeting with this committee again. And um, from documents that were released through freedom of information requests, um, which is another thing that school psychs can do, you can just know that you can request anything from your Department of Public Instruction um, because that's yours. You're a taxpayer and, and we have the right to read emails and meeting notes and all kinds of things. So um, we requested, I requested, and a bunch of people did, and we all got these documents. In the documents, there seemed to be some evidence, um, maybe that our superintendent was trying to influence the vote before the final committee vote um, to, you know, towards I Station. He's a he's a big fan of personalized learning and um, the model that you know you can have a station in the classroom where kids are just engaging um, on the computer. Um, and so he maybe influenced the committee, but then also that day, the bad news was that a committee member leaked um, to someone outside of the department instruction and there are text messages to prove it. So there was a leak from inside. There was someone who texted someone else and said, this is how everyone voted. And the superintendent tried to influence us and that's bad. So, um, as a result, our superintendent said that that second uh, RFP committee, the second thing had to be disbanded again. Um, and so that was this past January and our legislature mandated that we had to have an assessment tool, you know, ready to go by the time school started for the 2019-20 school year. So as a result, our superintendent um, made his own committee and did this like negotiation process and all of it was i think legal i don't really know for sure but um he basically got his own group of nine people four of them were voting members um, one of those four voting members was not a school psychologist but she's very well versed in literacy and early childhood and she pretty abruptly left the department of public instruction and has not commented publicly on any of the goings on. Wow. Um, so it just gets like more and more. Um, so that was one of the four voting members. The second four of the four was a psychometrician. Great. That's good. We need them. Um, the third one and fourth one were both um, women who our superintendent hired specifically when he was hired or when he won. Um, we have elected superintendents in North Carolina. Sorry, this is getting really long. But no, it's good. <laughs> Interesting. I'm on the edge of my seat, seriously. Yeah. So our, our superintendent, um, it's an elected position. He's a Republican. That's fine. Um, but our at the time he was elected, we had 
a supermajority, a Republican supermajority in our state legislature, which means um, that he was, although he was elected like by the thinnest of margins, it was like less than a thousand votes. So vote, that's one thing school psychologists can do. Please vote in every election all the time and know what you're doing when you're voting. Um, but he was elected, he won, and he, you know all his friends were in the legislature. And so they um, gave him $700,000 to just like hire some people <laughs> from what I gather. So he hired a couple friends maybe, or just people who he thought were well qualified um, for some jobs that didn't exist before for any other superintendent. And um, they get paid well, you know, like 80,000 plus, which is good money in North Carolina um, to be like his advisors. And they were on this final committee of four people, right? So two of them, I say, have a conflict of interest because their job depends on the superintendent who hired them and gave them this special job. And now they're being asked to vote and they clearly know what product he favors. Um, and then the other two, I guess, voted um, in tandem because according to our superintendent, the vote was unanimous for I station. And then it went to the Bo state board of education. Um, and they were also unanimous for I station. So who knows what, you know, what happened or why, um, you know, I guess lots of people think it was maybe not the most fair and unbiased <laughs> proposal review in the history of time. Um, but I think for now, it'll probably stand. Um, where we're at right now in North Carolina is uh, Amplify, who publishes in class. They did file an official protest of the contract being awarded to iStation. And that protest was filed back in June. And first, our superintendent responded by saying to Amplify, um, no, you, you submitted your protest like two days too late. So we're not even going to look at it. And it was because of some state law about going to church on Sundays, there's like a provision that if the deadline is on a Saturday or Sunday, you can extend it to Monday. And Amplify found that law and was like, no, we didn't turn it in late because they had submitted it on a Monday. <clears throat> I mean, I guess the deadline was a Saturday. So anyway, once the superintendent decided um, that, okay, I guess we'll consider Amplify's protest of this contract award, um, then he had 10 days to respond to Amplify. And he responded on day seven and said, you know, no, um, we're, we you don't win the contract, which was expected. It, you know, it would be shocking if he were to turn around and say, oh, yeah, you're right. You're, you have a good product. But he said no. Um, that was interesting because that's the day that we were told, we being um, the testing reform group that I'm a part of, we were told that this would be an open meeting between Amplify and the Department of Public Instruction. Um, you know, but being an open meeting, that means as taxpayers and citizens and residents, um, we can go. So you can go to your state board of education meetings. You can go to your local board of education meetings, go to meetings. It's a great way to get to know people and find out what's going on. So we decided we would go to the state board of education meeting being an open meeting. And we got in, got our badges, signed in, met all the Amplify people, um, headed upstairs with them. You know, we were escorted up, we were seated in the room. And then probably for about 10 minutes we were there and then a security guard came in and told us that we would have to leave, the three um, parents who were there, myself included. And so they stopped the meeting or what, you know, took us out of the Department of Public Instruction and we talked to their communications director of the Department of Public Instruction and asked, you know, we thought this was an open meeting. Um, he said no, that it, it would have been changed, I guess, to a closed meeting, um, which would be fine, except that iStation had their attorney in the meeting um, and he's not a, a party that should have been there, right? So it was a meeting between Amplify and the Department of Public Instruction. So why was iStation's attorney the one who sent the cease and desist um, in that meeting. And we still haven't gotten an answer on that. Um, so, you know, there are Freedom of Information Act, there are sunshine laws and, and all of that, but you still can't compel um, records to be released mm -hmm. um, or information to be released within any kind of time frame without taking someone to court. So that's what um, we've heard from the Attorney General. We've asked for emails in between 
our superintendent and I station because those are publicly available. Um, you know, we should all be able to read them. And we were told by the attorney's office, the attorney general's office, that um, we'd have to take them to court and compel them to turn over the documents, which we're not going to do because we don't have money. So. <laughs> Oh my gosh, this, this is like a soap opera. This is yeah. like, you know, on the edge of your, like, this is really, really. I'm thinking like a Dan Brown novel or something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right now we don't know because the, once the superintendent said that the protest was not being honored, you know, that um, he's, he's not having it amplifies protest. Well, then their next step is to take it to the Department of Information Technology um, which because this is a tech procurement, um, because iStation is done on the computer, mm -hmm. the, the Department of Information Technology, it sounds like from everything that I've read and talked to people, um, they kind of get to make the final call and say whether this procurement process was above board. And if so, then the contract stands. And if not, I don't know what happens from there, but um, you know, I'm crossing my fingers that we get to find out, I guess. Wow. Wow. It's, it's sad that public education can't be transparent because mm -hmm. this is the opposite of being transparent. I mean, they're, they're really shady. <laughs> right. Yeah. Very political. It has, is. has some of the social media, or I think there were some regular media articles about, the, mm -hmm. about this too. Has that helped at all? Has that empowered parents and your advocacy group? But it seems like the, the superintendent should be kind of afraid of the parents. I mean, they're, <laughs> they're the text. They're the, they're the kind of his boss. So is, has that helped? Has that given you some leverage? Yeah, I think, I think um, to some extent, you know, that's probably why he was willing to meet. Okay. Um, I was not personally invited. I don't know that he would invite me to a meeting. So I attended a meeting with the superintendent with a friend um, who's a like full-time advocate for um, literacy and teaches structured literacy and is just amazing. Um, but she set up the meeting with the superintendent and then said she'd be bringing someone with her, but never named me. Um, so we were kind of waiting for them to kick me out again or do something, but they, they didn't. So that was nice. Um, but yeah, I think the media has certainly, certainly the superintendent has noticed and felt it because um, in this meeting that we had with him on Friday, he referred to um, the unfortunate events that have happened this summer. <laughs> and I said, yeah, that's interesting. Really, I've just been doing research this summer. Um, sort of unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> who notices? You know, we have in as as um you know happens around the country. We have marches in Raleigh in our state capital, um, and have had those for two years, where schools are closed across the state, and we have thousands of teachers showing up and marching on our state capital and demanding um, adequate funding. And this year, one of actually the the top priority. The reason I have this poster with it right here, <laughs> it says specialists make students bloom or make schools bloom. Um, that was from a friend because the number one priority for our teacher march this year in Raleigh was um, specialized instructional support personnel and improving our ratios for psychs and um, counselors and social workers and everybody. So, um, you know, that's another way, I guess, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm talking all over, but one of my, my favorite things about advocacy is that there's a place for everyone. So there's a place for you if you want to write letters or make phone calls. Um, there's a place for you if you want to get really angry and march, you know, and make a big sign. And I did that too. Um, I love marching. I love a protest. My friends always joke, like, if there's a protest, just tell Chelsea. <laughs> like, on the bus with my sign, like, I'll march all over the place. Um, bring my kids, they make signs, you know, so I think um, that no matter what you want to do, you know, for some people, that's the kind of like advocacy that's off putting to them and, and sort of confrontational. And um, that's fine. You know, you can set up meetings with your legislator or your, your state senator, you know, just get the word out there, even just going and saying, I'm a school psychologist, this is what I do. Yeah. Um, that's huge. And just getting to know your representatives by name. Um, they're gonna think of you and remember you. I think we're finally getting to the point in North Carolina where some, maybe most of our um, representatives know what school psychologists are and that we're not the same as social workers and counselors. So that's a good step. 
<laughs> Great. Well, we're getting close. We want to be respectful yeah. of your time. There was one thing that you mentioned that I, I, I don't know if it fits and if anyone out there has some um, last minute comments or questions, please uh, type them in. But um, you mentioned the paradox of school psychology as taught to you by um, Bill Erkel. Erkel, yeah. Well, yeah, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, so Bill was my dissertation advisor and all around awesome person. And he is in ugh, California now, I think he left North Carolina State. Okay. Um, and he taught us all kind of during our foundational, what is school psychology sort of course in grad school. Um, the, one of the first things that he talked about is the paradox of school psychology, which is that in order to help the most students and to be the most effective, we kind of have to push ourselves um, to work with higher levels in the system. So we have to work effectively with parents and with teachers, and then just up from there, um, administrators and school boards and state school boards and on and on. Um, you know, the, the higher up you go, yes, you're getting more removed from the student, but you're also impacting hmm more students. Um, so I think that's important when we're talking about advocacy and bringing systems level change that, and it's, it's again, like we need people at all those levels. We need to be working um, to build good relationships with parents and other teachers and, and everybody. Um, but that paradox is true for advocacy too, that you know you can advocate for one student and we do every day um, in our testing and in how we write reports and how we do interventions and all those, you know, that's our job is advocating for one student, uh, but we can affect even bigger changes and stretch ourselves to kind of move up to the next level of advocacy. Such a great message. That's good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, last, it doesn't seem like we have any questions um, coming in. So I think we'll, we'll start to wrap, but um, I did want to say September 1st is our first official kind of back to school episode, we're going to be talking about positive psychology, and it's going to be a really great one. Um, as you guys know, this was a new platform tonight. So we'd, we'd like um, some feedback on that. I think that maybe it comes September, we'll try and stream to YouTube, which we have been using YouTube Live and Google Hangouts, but now that's gone, but we can still use stream to YouTube. It'll be, it'll be a little bit different, a little bit of a different YouTube than what we're used to. Um, so I think we'll try that next time and maybe get some feedback on, do you guys like this format better um, than the other one? It's just a matter of where you're putting your comments on the YouTube or um, on Facebook. So um, so that'll be good. But thank you so, so much for coming and talking with us yeah. and spending your summer being such an amazing advocate. Thank you for having me. Truly inspired, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm I'm gonna click the end broadcast button, and I think that hopefully that should <laughs> see everybody in uh, September. Enjoy your summers. All right.